My name is Barb Van Hoy. Welcome. Um, we are going to have um, folks from our collaborating organizations briefly describe <coughs> some of the resources that they can provide to folks um, regarding uh, help needed around um, uh, tenants, uh, rental, um, and uh, other issues. And so the first um, first person who is going to come up and present is Deb Hamilton, who is with the Pikes Peak Library District, is the law librarian. So um, welcome down. Oh, I can do that. Yeah. You know what? Hi, everyone. My name is Deb Hamilton. I'm the law librarian at Pikes Peak Library District. Um, we do have a law library at our downtown location, the Penrose Library. It's closed right now for renovations, but it will be open again at the beginning of April. In the meantime, though, you can access some of our legal resources at the East Library location. Um, so Barb has pulled up here our website. If you go to research along the top there, and then law collection at the bottom of that first column, there you can find a lot of different resources that the library has, as well as resources that you can access on the web. Um, you can also find my contact information here as well. So if you need to get in touch with me about something you're trying to research in the law, um, you can reach me there. So I'll go ahead and end there so we don't take up too much of your time. Right, you can um, introduce Laura. Introduce okay, and next up we have Laura McKernan with us. She's joining us online, um, and she's going to talk about the Justice Center, which is another legal services nonprofit here in Colorado Springs where you can get legal help. Hi everyone, my name is Laura McKernan. I am the Executive Director of the Justice Center. I uh, am very happy to be joining you today. I'm actually out of the country celebrating my mom's 80th birthday, but I'm very happy to be here with you guys today. The Justice Center provides free legal advice. A phone number, our phone number, you can call us. Um, either get advice on Wednesday nights or you can email us, ask at justicecentercos.org, and you can have your question answered by a Colorado Bard attorney. Um, you can also apply to be able to get a attorney to take one of your cases, um, either for free or for a reduced fee, depending on your income. And uh, we also have a very exciting pro project called the Housing Ambassador Project. If you want to help your neighbors, not only yourself, but also your neighbors understand the law um, and how to navigate difficult situations and difficult conversations, you can apply to become part of the housing. So thank you for having me here today. And I hope that you guys get to hear Clinton Albert, who is an expert in the area and just tremendously good at what he does. Thank you, Laura. And then Ruby, are you online? Um, can you talk about the Colorado Economic Defense Project? Yes, hi Barb. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ruby Lopez. I am the Director of Community Services with the Community Economic Defense Project, CEDP for short. Um, what I sent out to Barb are a couple of resources. Hopefully you see them here on the chat in a little bit, but CDP helps with housing assistance through um, emergency rental assistance programs um, statewide. Right now, one that I do want to talk about, and here is our website, cdpproject.org. If you just go on and click get help, you have access to all of our intakes to be filled out and contacted by a CDEP staff member. We have um, assistance for temporary rental assistance grants. This is a new rental assistance program that opened up um, selection based from February. Every 15th of the month up to May, the window will be opening. So track temporary rental assistance grants to fill out a pre-application. And upon being selected, you're able to complete a full application for rental assistance. One of the eligibility requirements is that you cannot have had assistance within a 12 month period with another rental assistance program. We also assist with ERAP, the emergency rental assistance program. And you can access the intake here. I need help with an eviction to get started on that. 
For our um, mobile home owners, there is also, if you click on I need help with a foreclosure, even though it's not a foreclosure, you'll have access to our emergency mortgage assistance program that does include lot rent assistance. The eligibility requirement there is you must own the mobile home that you occupy to receive the lot rent. Um, we have our care center. All this information isn't accessible online. You're able to call our care center. I will go ahead and drop the care center phone number and chat text link in the chat as well if you want to contact them. Our care center agents are amazing and they are very knowledgeable about all programs for rental assistance and can also guide you through our knowledge base for other resources around your area. Thank you so much, Ruby. We appreciate that. And folks, we will um, uh, drop, for those of you who are online, we'll drop these links in the chat. And for those of us who, you who are joining in person, if you do sign in on the sign-in sheet back there, um, we will uh, send out to you the recording of this uh, presentation as well as links to a lot of those resources as well. Will that have her phone? She said the phone number too. I don't have internet. Oh, phone number? Ruby, did you, did you yes. say a phone number? So I have it here in the chat. Um, the main phone number for Care Center is 303. 838 1200. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Does your system have a volume control? You know what? We turned that up as high as possible. Oh, okay. But that I think is the last one um, for online. Or actually, is Kathy Verdier? I wasn't sure if Kathy was joining us from Colorado Habits and Connects. Okay, I think that's enough. Great. Well, um, in that case, without any further ado, I will um, welcome and introduce Kristen Albert, who um, works with the Colorado Legal Services as um, the landlord tenant, um, one of the landlord tenant attorneys, uh, who's going to go through landlord tenant law for you. And I need to stop sharing so that you can share. Uh, well, Clinton's bringing that up for those of you who are online. We are going to hold, and everyone here, we're going to hold questions until the end. Those of you who are online will have the option to either write your questions in chat or Often it's better you'll be able to unmute yourself and ask a question in person. If we can get if the sound is working correctly, if not, you can use the chat function in Microsoft Teams to submit a question, and um, and we'll get those to Clinton. And there it is. All right, perfect. All right, good evening, folks. My name is Clinton Albert. I'm an attorney with Colorado Legal Services. Uh, let's get the slideshow going. Maybe, maybe not. All right. Um, so a few things to keep in mind as we go through the information tonight, and that is first and foremost, this is for informational purposes only. Uh, housing issues require a thoughtful analysis of the facts of your situation and the law that may or may not apply to your situation. So this really isn't the proper forum for that. Um, if you are a low-income member of the community or a senior citizen and you're facing a housing issue, you may co contact Colorado Legal Services at 719-471-0380 or in person at our office at 102 South Tejon Street, um, Suite 430. All right, so uh, starting off this evening, there were some laws that were passed last year in 2023 that did not take effect until January 1 of this year. At some point, we'll learn about them. There we go. Uh, so uh, one, of those, one of those bills dealt with pets, security deposit, pet insurance, writs of restitution, just your animals. And the other, the other big addition and, uh, to rights for tenants is the right to participate remotely in eviction hearings as well as to file answers electronically uh, to save a trip down to the courthouse or to uh, to the clerk's office. 
All right, so let's talk about our little four-legged friends here. Um, so new updates to insurance. Insure, uh, insurers are not able to refuse to issue, cancel, refuse to renew or increase a premium or rate for homeowners insurance or dwelling fire insurance based upon a dog's breed. Uh, this does not apply to situations where there is a basis that the particular dog is known to be dangerous. Uh, what about, but that's on the insurance side of things. This is more on the tenant side of things. And that is that moving forward, this is effective January 1, uh, landlords are not able to charge a pet security deposit that is greater than $300 and such deposit must be fully refundable consistent with security deposit, existing security deposit laws. It can no longer be a non-refundable deposit. Uh, there's no longer an ability to demand monthly pet rent uh, that is greater than $35 or 1.5% of what the monthly rent is. Can you slow down what was the percentage? 1.5. And folks, I'll do my best to slow down, but we have quite a few areas of law to get through tonight, and I do want to leave room for questions at the end. Um, so pets and the writ of restitution. Writ of restitution is the document that allows law enforcement to remove you from the residence after an eviction case and with a valid court order and return possession to your landlord or former landlord. But what happens when you have a pet present in the residence? Well. The sheriff deputy must immediately inspect the premises for any pet animals. If you are present when this is happening, if the tenant is president, present, sorry, then the officer must give any pets to the tenant. If the tenant is not present, if this law enforcement officer in El Paso County, the sheriff's, the sheriff's department is the one who executes writs of restitution. So if the deputy or the deputies come to execute the writ of restitution and no one is at home at that time, then the landlord will permit access to the local animal authority to remove and secure the pet and provide the local animal authority with the name and contact information of the tenant. And the landlord must post a notice at the premises in a visible place with the name and contact information where the pet was taken. And upon the tenant's request, shall provide the tenant with the name and contact information where the pet has been taken. So it, there's has to be a posting on the property as well as provide that information upon request. So no pet shall be removed from the premises and left unattended on public or private property. It must be secured. So uh, pets and liens. Um, this is a unique, this, this is not gonna come up a whole lot. Uh, it applies to unique circumstances where a tenant rents a residence for the housekeeping purposes of the landlord's tenants. Uh, it's kind of rent is part of the compensation package. Uh, landlords are unable to obtain a lien against a person's pets. Cannot hold landlords are unable to claim prop, claim possession over a person's pets and have a lien executed against them. Um, the new law, I think that's gonna be a unique situation to begin with. So I really can't speak too much more on what that actually means. Uh, so that's the pet side of things that went into effect beginning of 2024. In addition to that, there's also virtual hearings and electronic filings are now available to everyone statewide. Uh, for example, in El Paso County, we've been having remote hearings uh, ever since 2020 and that has not changed. Elsewhere in the state, the hearings were conducted in person and there was not an opportunity for a virtual hearing, a remote hearing. However, that is now guaranteed statewide to all tenants and all landlords. So parties and witnesses may choose to appear remotely by phone or video or in person. You don't have to appear remotely if you don't want to. Uh, for example, some folks this evening has, have indicated that, hey, I don't have internet at home. You don't have to choose to do that and you can still choose to appear in person. You must make that choice on a complaint or an answer. Uh, you can also change how you would like to appear, but you must provide the court with at least 48 hours notice uh, prior to the hearing date or the appearance date. If it is less than 48 hours notice, then the court has the discretion to deny that request. So 
if you are a tenant and you are facing an eviction on your own, uh, you have the ability to now file an answer electronically using the court's electronic filing system. Uh, you can also file motion fee waiver motions as well through this. Uh, there is no filing fee for a motion to waive filing fees. That would seemingly defeat the purpose of a motion to waive the filing fees to require a filing fee to waive the filing fees. Um, if a party is appearing virtually at a hearing or an appearance, and at some point they disconnect from the hearing, that does not mean that that individual will then lose the hearing because of that disconnection. The court will make all reasonable efforts to contact the party. That may be calling them, emailing them, whatever it may be, and they shall allow a reasonable time for the party to reconnect with the court. If the party is unable to reestablish connection, and this is not just limited to the to tenants, this is landlords as well. If they are appearing remotely and that connection is disrupted, uh, and they're not unable, they're not able to get back into the court the court proceeding, then the court shall reschedule the hearing for the first available date and shall not enter a default judgment. In the same area here regarding virtual hearings and electronic filings, they also have, have imposed new requirements for a summons. So a summons, which we will get to later in the presentation, is the court document that says, hey, there's been a lawsuit filed. This is the date where you need to appear. The summons has required language in it. The summons now also must include uh, an advisement that you have a right to appear virtually for a hearing and that a disconnection will not result in a default judgment. Uh, the blank answer form that is required to be included with a summons must include a place for a tenant to choose virtual or in-person participation and there's also must be information about a pro se party, how they can go about electronically filing documents related to the case. So if, if you have transportation issues or, uh, you know, I, I guess this week with the impending snowstorm that we're seeing moving through and all the weather warnings of plan on not traveling Thursday, you'd be able to file electronically if you have a court date on Thursday and still need to get that file. So the, this, these are, these are requirements for the summons, but the court also must, must provide any party who chooses to participate virtually with the necessary information about how to participate virtually. Login information, uh, what app to download if they're using an app, uh, phone numbers to call, anything of that nature. All right, so those are the updates that have gone into effect beginning 2024. There are websites to see what is pending in the state legislature for 2024. I talk about these things when they become law and not before. Uh, so starting off kind of the voyage and tenancy here, right? And this is before you move into your new place, your new home, new residence, there are a few things I think are important to be mindful of. First of all, put everything in writing. I don't care what it is. Put it in writing if there's an agreement. A lease is a contract between you and your landlord. It is a binding contract. If there is some kind of promise, if this is a written lease and there is some kind of promise that is not in the written lease, guess what? It's likely not part of the lease. So, and that doesn't mean that oral leases are not valid. They are valid. However, it will be difficult to prove specific terms. Uh, and the best practice really is to have a written agreement here. All right, now, we're putting things in writing, but before we get to that lease stage, a lot of times we're applying for residences. We're applying to see if we will be accepted for a tenancy at a place. So the Rental Application Fairness Act uh, covers what can and cannot be asked of and what can and cannot be considered when, uh, determine, when making a determination of someone's application for tenancy. So first of all, we have application fees. Landlords are not able, not able to charge an application fee unless they use the entire amount to cover the costs and processing. Costs may be the actual expenses or the average expenses if we're processing like a batch of applications at once. Cannot charge different amounts to different applicants. Uh, landlords must also provide a written disclosure for the anticipated or actual expenses to process the application and a receipt to the applicant for any fee paid. 
Landlords must make good faith efforts to return remaining amounts of the fee or fees to the applicant or applicants. These are some updates that went into effect last year uh, towards the fall. Uh, so at this point, landlords are not able to ask about income except to determine that income equals or exceeds 200% of the annual cost of rent that is to be paid by the prospective tenant. It is now the maximum that can be required is two times the monthly rent, not three times. So we're it's capped at two times. And if it is the annual cost, a housing voucher is required to be computed as part of a tenant's income. So it is that can no longer be used to kind of work around something like a 200%. You must factor in the voucher as part of the income. Landlords shall not require a tenant to have income that's greater than 200%. Uh, landlords are able to ask about income for the purpose of determining whether a tenant would qualify for an income restricted residence. Some properties have kind of caps on income, so landlords are able to ask for that purpose as well. Landlords are not able to ask about credit scores, adverse credit, event, credit events, or a lack or lack of credit score unless the landlord is required by federal law to consider a credit score or lack of credit score in a rental application. The penalties have also increased here. So for landlords who do not follow the Rental Application Act, they are now subject to treble damages for the application fee, treble being three, uh, court costs and potential attorney fees. A violation of sections 1C or 1D is a $50 penalty and then a $2,500 penalty if it is not cured, plus economic damages, court costs, and attorney fees. There is no requirement for a tenant to exhaust any administrative, administrative remedies prior to filing a lawsuit. So, what rental or credit history can a landlord consider? The past seven years, nothing outside of that. What about a criminal history? An arrest record? Nope. Uh, arrest can never be a reason to deny an application. You could have 100 arrests. If there are zero convictions, there are zero reasons to deny an application. What about criminal convictions? You know, arrests are gonna be different than convictions. No convictions that are older than five years, except generally speaking, methamphetamine related offenses beyond simple possession. So possession with intent, uh, distribution, uh, possession, of some, in some cases, possession of precursor materials, those can be used to deny an application regardless of the age. Any offense that requires a person to register as a sex offender pursuant to Colorado revised statute 1622-103, homicide related offenses, and stalking. Those convictions, it does not matter how old they are, they can be used to deny a rental application. One big new addition uh, to rental applications is sometimes these fees get expensive. So if you're out and you're trying to paper five, six, 10 apartments, trying to find a new residence, those fees add up real quick. So now the legislate, the statutes provide a way to cut costs or to save on that. And that is through a portable tenant screening, uh, portable tenant screening. So an applicant does not have to pay a rental application fee if the applicant provides the landlord with a portable tenant screening report. This is a, what is it? So it's a consumer report prepared at the request of the applicant that includes information provided by a consumer reporting agency about the applicant and the date through which the information is current. <coughs> so what is the information? We're talking name, contact information, verification of employment and income, last known address, and for each jurisdiction indicated in the report as a prior residence of the applicant, uh, regardless of whether the residence is reported by the applicant or by the reporting agency. And that's going to be rental and credit history for those jurisdictions and a criminal history record check for all convictions of a prospective tenant. Did you need credit history too? Did you just said you couldn't? The portable tenant screening report can include that. Okay. The, the report can include that. Uh, also with the Rental Application Fairness Act, uh, if there is a decision to deny, and we'll get to that here, we should get to that here in just a second, that decision must be put in writing and the reasons for the denial must also be put in writing. 
So uh, landlords are required to accept a portable tenant screening report, but they may require uh, some a, a few kind of conditions, qualifications here. They may require that the report be completed within the previous 30 days, that the report be made directly available to the landlord by the reporting agency or provided through a third party website that regularly engages in this business of providing these reports and complies with state and federal law. Uh, also, they may require that the screening report is made available to them at to the landlord at no cost to access or use in the application process. And they may require a statement from the applicant that there has not been a material change in the information in the screening report since the report was generated. Uh, landlords are not able to charge a fee uh, to or to access or use the report. And then prior to any action expecting an application fee, prior to taking any kind of application, landlords shall advise an applicant of the following things. That the individual has a right to provide a screening report. And if the individual <laughs> provides a report, then the landlord is prohibited from charging an application fee. Charging an if you can mute yourself, that'd be great. All right, so we're still on screening reports here. Uh, so this advisement that we just went through about what is required to tell an applicant, uh, it has to be delivered in a method reasonably likely to reach an applicant, including advertisements. If there's an advertisement for rent, you can put it in that. Uh, other public notices of availability in at least 12 point bold font. Do not hide this in six point font in the corner. Uh, on a homepage of a website maintained by the landlord or the landlord's agent in at least 12 point bold font. See a theme developing here? In a paper or online rental application for the dwelling unit in 12 point bold font. Uh, or you can orally tell somebody uh, with a written confirmation of receipt by the applicant of the advisement. So even if you tell them verbally, you have to get a written receipt saying that they have been told. It may be the best practice to just put it in writing. So there are landlords which are exempt from that uh, portable screening reports. And those are landlords that do not accept more than one application fee at a time for a unit or does not accept more than one application fee at a time from each applicant, applicant group for the unit. And the landlord refunds the total fee to each applicant within 20 days after written communication declining to enter into the lease agreement. So that is when a landlord does not have to accept a portable screening report. And in that situation, if the application is then denied, then the entire amount has, the entire application fee must be refunded. Uh, denials of an application can be electronic unless the applicant requests a paper denial. If there is a request for a paper denial, then pen needs to be put to paper. All right, if an applicant submits an application and then the landlord obtains a consumer report, then the landlord shall provide a copy of that report to the applicant and an advisement of the applicant's right to dispute the accuracy of the consumer report with the reporting agency. The attorney general may independently initiate civil and criminal actions to enforce the Rental Application Fairness Act. So those were updates that happened last fall. Going back here about what happened, we're still in the rent, we're still applying here. So what happens if the application is denied? You've submitted it, it's now been denied. So that prospective landlord must provide you with written notice of the application denial, like we just covered. That can be electronic, However, if you request it be in paper, you have a right to it being in paper. The notice shall include the reasons for the denial. And the landlord shall make good faith effort to provide this denial to you within 20 calendar days of the decision to deny the application. And again, we've covered this. Um, the app, if the Rental Application Fairness Act is not followed uh, as an individual, uh, the applicant can be wrongfully denied applicant, uh, can seek three times the amount of the application fee, court costs, and reasonable attorney fees. Some violations now include additional possible penalties up to $2,500. Must give 
if you are contemplating this type of action, you must give the prospective landlord notice of the intention to file the action at least seven days before filing it. So you've got to give them a kind of a week heads up of, hey, I'm going to file a lawsuit for these reasons. Um, and in that seven day period, that prospective landlord can fix the problem. And then if somebody says, hey, I'm going to be bringing this claim and it is a meritless claim. They said, you denied me for my homicide conviction from 1988. They are allowed to do that. That would be a meritless claim. And they may be liable for the landlord's court costs and the landlord's attorney fees in that situation. All right. We've gotten through the application. We're now at our lease agreement. It's been approved. We're about to move in. So first thing to do, review the lease. I don't care if it's one page. I don't care if it's a thousand pages. If it's a thousand pages, that's a little bit of a red flag, but everybody's allowed to write their own contracts. Uh, however, read it. Every line, every sentence, every paragraph, every page. Why? Because these, in some of these leases, the devil's going to be in the details, and you want to make sure that you know what is expected of me as a tenant as I'm entering into this entering into this contract. Also, what should I expect of my landlord as I'm entering into this contract? So some things to pay attention to. What's the, what's the length of the lease? Is that consistent with what you thought it was? Right? If you think you are signing a two-year lease and you look at the lease agreement and the term is six months, well, that may need to be something to have a conversation about, or that may need to be edited. Because once you sign it, that's what you've agreed to. What happens at the end of the initial lease term? Does it automatically renew? Does there need to be a written, does there need to be a written extension of the lease? Or does the lease just end at that time? What about potential fees that could come up throughout the tenancy? Late fees. Also, look, pay attention to any kind of uh, damage fees as it relates to security deposits. And that's going to be important because also, what are your responsibilities for upkeep and maintenance? What do you have to do? It's a single family residence. Do you have to, do you have to maintain the drive, the sidewalk? And also, what, a, what obligations does your landlord have? Are they providing you with the salt to maintain that sidewalk in that situation? Um, with the storm, snow shoveling's on my mind tonight, folks. Uh, also, this is incredibly important. The lease is required to have this information, but where do you send a notice? Your heat goes out. Uh, you have a broken window. There's now a hole in your in the ceiling in the roof for some reason. Where do you tell your landlord, "Hey, I have an emergency. There's an, I've got a habitability issue and I need assistance." All right. So you need to. It must include where you're going to send any notices. And lastly, any rules for the unit as well. Any rules that are any kind of house rules, common rules. Uh, if there are rules and regulations referred to in the lease and you do not see what they are, make sure you get a copy, all right? Um, the reason for that is if you sign it, it is assumed that you know what you are signing. And I didn't read it is not going to help you in court if you, if you wind up in a dispute here. Other sections to review, some leases and some tenancies are considered to be an exempt residential agreement. That must be stated in the lease agreement. So if you see that, that's going to mean essentially that you have a five-day notice, a five-day cure period for demands. Um, this is also only going to apply to single-family residences. So if you're in an apartment, then you can just kind of assume that that is not going to apply to you. Uh, also, what about warranty of habitability related section, sections here? What appliances are going to be included in the lease agreement? Because the appliances included in the lease agreement are going to be subject to the warranty of habitability. Additionally, like we just talked about that notice related section, what is the email address or portal that you are to use for electronic notice delivery for the warranty of habitability? All right, so again, what's an exempt residential agreement? If your lease has that, that designation, uh, it gives a tenant five days notice instead of 10. Uh, this must be written in the lease that the 10 day notice period does not apply to the tenancy. This only applies to a single family home, not an apartment or a condo, and only applies to single family homes leased by a landlord who owns five or fewer single family rental homes. Uh, sometimes we see an option to purchase. So these are agreements and where parties are free to contract these type of agreements and <clears throat> free to come up with these kind of agreements, but carefully consider them before entering into an option to purchase agreement. 
I would recommend seeking legal counsel prior to signing these. Oftentimes they require a large financial commitment. You wanna make sure that what you are sign, signing that you're okay with the risk that it involves or that you have some assurances uh, that you have protection for building and keeping any equity in the home. What are some red flag lease provisions? Now, if these are in your lease, I'd say it's a red flag, but they're not gonna be enforceable. Uh, the law prohibits them from being enforced. So as a tenant, you cannot waive in your lease agreement the right to the return of the security deposit. You cannot waive uh, you, the protections pursuant to the warranty of habitability unless there is a separate written agreement supported by consideration that we will get to later. You cannot waive your right to the covenant of quiet enjoyment. You cannot waive your right to a five or 10 day demand for unpaid rent or 30 days if this is subject, if this is a CARES Act property. You also cannot waive the court process for an FED, forcible entry and detainer. That's the phrase for eviction. So if you hear FED, forcible entry detainer, that's all kind of one, those are all synonyms for eviction. You also cannot agree to late fees that are greater than $50 or 5% of the rent. A lease cannot include an unreasonable liquidated damages clause that assigns a cost stemming from an eviction notice or action. A lease cannot include a one-way fee shifting clause that awards attorney fees and court costs only to one party. Any fee shifting clause must award attorney fees to prevailing party after the court's determination of reasonableness. So if you've got a lease from 2015 and these provisions are in there somehow, well, they may be because they may have been okay in 2015. They are no longer enforceable. They are void. The rest of the lease is likely remaining in full effect, but the unenforceable lease provisions are just that. They are unenforceable. So last year we had some updates to this. Uh, you cannot waive your right to a jury trial in an eviction case, except you can waive a jury trial for possession portion of an eviction case. As broadly speaking, two phases, possession and damages. Possession being the first phase, and the court's role there is to determine who has the right to possess the property, meaning do I get evicted or not? So that one, you do not necessarily have a right to a jury trial. You cannot waive your ability to join a joint action, a class action, or a collective legal action relating to the terms of the tenancy. You cannot waive the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. You cannot waive the implied covenant of quiet enjoyment. You cannot, there cannot be any fee for not providing a notice of non-renewal for the end of the lease, except for a landlord's actual damages. To break that down a little bit more, uh, leases in the past may have included some language to the effect of, um, you are required to give us a 60-day notice that you do not intend to renew your lease agreement. If you do not provide us with a 60-day notice, we will charge you, you know, an additional month, you know, the equivalent of one month's rent. That is no longer enforceable. If the lease says you are required to provide X amount of notice, and you do not provide that amount that amount of notice, then you will only be liable for a landlord's actual damages. Uh, you can't have any lease clauses that characterize things as rent that aren't rent. Um, so any lease clause that characterizes any fees for utilities or services and any other charge that is not the monthly payment for the occupancy of the premises as rent. If it is something that is not the literal roof over your head, it is not rent. So rent is rent and you can't, you just can't call other things rent. It's not. Uh, there cannot be a provision which requires a tenant to pay a fee markup uh, or for a service for which the landlord is being billed by a third party, except a written lease may charge a fee no greater than 2% of the actual cost or up to $10 per month, but not both. Um, voucher and subsidy providers are not able and are barred from pursuing an eviction for the non-payment of utilities. So we've gone through these clauses that are not allowed in your lease. What must be in your lease? Uh, other than basic contractual obligations, such as offer acceptance and consideration, uh, written leases must include a statement that Colorado statute prohibits income discrimination and requires landlords to accept any lawful and verifiable source of money. 
you, we're going to see this language pop up quite a bit as an exception, and I'm going to shorthand this to the five or fewer. Uh, this required lease clause does not apply to landlords with five or fewer single family rental homes and no more than five total rental units, including any single family rental homes. That's going to be a common exception that we'll see throughout laws. All right, we've read it. We're okay with it. It says what we, we thought we were agreeing to, and we signed it. Get a copy. Get a copy, back it up, keep it in a safe place. I, in fact, keep everything that's related to your tenancy together. Rent receipts, your lease, security deposit receipts, communications with your landlord, and he notices you've received, keep them all handy in one place. One, you're gonna want a copy for your own records if there's ever a dispute. But also the law requires that your landlord provide you with a copy in seven days of you signing the lease. So what happens if, the, if you've signed this 12 month lease, you've signed an 18 month lease, and in the middle of the lease or two months into it, your landlord changes or your building is sold. So if your landlord changes, but the ownership remains the same, it switches from property management company A to property management company B. The new landlord must provide you with updated contact information to include any new address or addresses for notices. If your new landlord does not do this, then I would recommend contacting your landlord requesting the information. Yes, that is putting the extra burden on you. However, you want to know who do I talk to if the heat goes out. If your building is for sale and your tenancy is jeopardized, um, you can record your lease with the clerk and recorder, and that would place any bona fide purchaser on notice of your possessory interest in the property. That doesn't make sense, that's okay. I would also recommend consulting legal advice uh, or consulting legal counsel prior to taking this step because you wanna make sure you get it right. This is related to uh, notice to potential buyers uh, that, hey, I live here and here's my lease, so I have a right to live here until the date on my lease. If you don't have a current lease agreement, then you may wanna contact the new owner to propose a new rental agreement. Um, they're, the timelines for an eviction may be a bit on the shorter side in that situation. Yeah. All right, what about, so we've gotten a copy of our lease, we're paying our rent. What about rent increases in our tenancy? <coughs> so regardless of a written rental agreement, the length of the tenancy, whether it's fixed month to month or an indefinite term, landlords shall not increase the rent more than one time in any 12 month period of consecutive occupancy. It may only be increased upon 60 days written notice to the tenant. That does not mean that six months into a 12 month lease, the rent gets to be increased. It's been agreed upon in the terms of the contract. That's been a 12 month guarantee of that price. Landlords may not terminate a residential tenancy with no agreement or with no written agreement by serving a notice to quit with the primary purpose of increasing the rent with less than 60 days notice. Late fees. So the following are prohibited. Um, and let's just give me one second before we get to the way of fees. Notice you've been taking fewer stents. It's oh. a little easier to annotate in, <laughs> in the you. margins. Sure. All right. So uh, late fees shall not take your my hands hurt just watching you scribble there. Oh. <laughs> All right, so uh, landlords are not able to charge a tenant or a homeowner a late fee unless the rent payment is late by at least seven calendar days. Your rent says when your rent is, your lease says when your rent is due. It is seven days from then. Cannot charge a tenant or a homeowner a late fee that exceeds $50 or 5% of the amount of past due rent. Cannot require a tenant or a homeowner to pay a late fee unless the late fee is disclosed in the rental agreement. And it still has to be valid. Mm -hmm. If the late fee provision of the lease is unenforceable, then guess what? There's no late fees disclosed in the lease agreement. Cannot remove or exclude a tenant from the dwelling or start a court process for eviction uh, because the tenant fails to pay one or more late fees to the landlord. Cannot terminate a tenancy or, a, or other estate at will or a lease in a mobile home park because a tenant or a homeowner fails to pay 
one or more late fees to the landlord. Cannot impose a late fee uh, for the late payment or non-payment of any portion of the rent that a rent subsidy provider rather than the tenant is responsible for paying. There are no late fees on late vouchers. <coughs> Cannot charge a late fee more than once for each late payment, except that you can charge more than once if the total amount remains within that acceptable, that acceptable range, $50 or 5% of what is late, whichever is greater. Can't require interest on a late fee. We're gonna keep going here. So cannot charge a late fee unless the landlord has provided the tenant or the homeowner with written notice of the late fee within 180 days after the date upon which the rent payment was due. A lease provision that does not comply with this statute is void, it's unenforceable, and as a tenant, you can bring a suit for what's called injunctive relief. That is where you're asking the court to say, hey, I need you to tell this other party to knock it off. And the court would, if that is accurate, then the court will tell the landlord or should be telling the landlord, you are not able to charge late fees. Uh, a landlord who violates the statute shall pay to the tenant a penalty in the amount of $50 for each violation. If a tenant sends a demand letter stating, hey, uh, you've been charging me illegal late fees. And in the back of the packet, there's a letter that kind of sums that up. Um, you provide a, a seven day letter. The landlord has seven days to cure the violation. And that time begins when the landlord receives the written or electronic notice of the violation of the late fee statute. If a landlord violates the statute and then they get the seven day letter and they don't fix it. And then the tenant brings the lawsuit, civil action. Uh, they can see compensatory damages. So the amount, you know, the 50, a penalty of 50 to $1,000 for each violation. Payable to the tenant or homeowner can see costs, including attorney fees to the prevailing party and other equitable, equitable relief that the court finds appropriate. And one late fee may violate the statute in a number of ways. If we charge a $100 late fee, on days two, three, four, five, six, and seven of the month, we are presumably way above 5%. We are above more than once. And these are all before seven days after the rent is late. So this statute can provide quite a bit of protection if it is if late fees are being imposed in violation of the law. So uh, it may be a defense uh, against an eviction eviction that there has been a violation of the statute. A late fee is distinct from rent and a rental agreement may not classify a late fee as rent for the purposes of non-payment. That's consistent with the update we just had reviewed where rent is rent. It is the cost for the roof over your head. It's not the cost for anything else. All right, you signed the lease, truck or the vans out front, I'm about to start moving our boxes in. Before we start moving in, please take the time to take the pictures. Maybe you have a maybe you have received a form from your land from your new landlord stating, please go through and let me know what is it, what is wrong with the property. If I do not receive this back from you, I will assume that everything is fine. You are also stating that when you do not provide that notice. So this may not be important on day one but it may be important on day 101. So you wanna make sure that you let your landlord know, these are some issues that I observed in the property, okay? Take pictures of it too, to document the condition that you received the property in, all right? Why, are the, why is this important? Why am I saying take this step? The law doesn't require that you take this step, but you're documenting the condition of your residence at the beginning. Whether it's damaged or undamaged, take a picture of everything. These pictures could be the difference between prevailing or losing on a security deposit type of case. Or if you're being evicted, or if your landlord is trying to evict you for damage to the property and you can show this was pre-existing, that's going to create a defense. So this documentation would also be crucial for security deposit disputes. In addition to the pictures, see if you can do a walkthrough. Again, it's not required by law, but I think this is a really good way to start off this relationship with your landlord. And if you're a landlord watching, I think it's a great way to start the relation off, relationship with your tenant. Everybody's on the same page of, 
hey, these are some things that are going on. This could be fixed. This faucet's leaky. Uh, this cabinet hinge looks like it's going to come off in about a week or so. All right. Um, you identify pre-existing damage. You can come up with a plan for addressing things that may or may not be acceptable. And you enter into this contract. You enter into the lease. You start your tenancy with the same understanding of the condition of your residence. So while it's not required, I think it's a great practice to engage in. So be critical, but don't be unreasonable, all right? You're not being a bother by pointing out existing damage. This is a business relationship. You are paying your landlord money. And, it, and I'm saying critical, but not unreasonable, all right? Don't complain that the refrigerator doesn't have a touchscreen computer in it. I, or an oven that has its own <clears throat> oven. Um, I've been seeing videos of ovens that uh, they are fancy. Um, so it's beneficial for both parties to have the same understanding of what it, what the condition of the property is. All right. One of the big issues here, one of the big areas that we run into a lot is the warranty of habitability. This is the promise that your residence is fit for a human being to live in. Uh, there are a list of things that by law must be present in your residence. You can also find that list in the packet. Uh, electronic notice. So we can place our landlords on notice of a habitability issue in writing or electronically. The work order is not a warranty of habitability demand. Okay. Um, so what makes up an electronic notice? It's noticed by electronic mail or an electronic portal or management communication system that is available to both a landlord and a tenant. So if you send electronic notice, you must send it in the manner that your landlord typically uses to communicate with you. Our landlords do not typically communicate with us through a work order portal. That is typically a one-sided communications portal. Um, and and well, we should also have that notice where we send that in our lease agreement itself, as that is a required section for the lease agreement. So, but when we're talking about the manner that your the manner, the method that your landlord typically uses to communicate with you, if you receive emails, then you can email. If you receive text messages, you can text message. If you have, I don't like text messages. I don't think they convey the full point. However, you can type it all out. It's just going to be a long text. You can find it. Uh, a template for the a warranty of habitability demand in the packet materials as well. <clears throat> so again, where do I send an electronic notice if my lease does not say where? Uh, it's going to be however your landlord has previously communicated with you. So if the lease doesn't say it, then practice controls. Landlord text you text. Um, make sure you keep sufficient proof of delivery. All right. If it's a text message. Take a screenshot. Save that screenshot somewhere. That way it doesn't get lost. You say, well, it was on my old phone and that old phone's broken, but we don't have proof of it anymore. All right. So what are the conditions that are subject to the warranty of habitability? Waterproofing, weather protections of your roof walls, doors, and windows. Plumbing and gas in good working order. Got to be running hot, running water, reasonable amounts of hot water, Proper fixtures and proper connections to sewage disposal systems. We've got to have functioning heating facilities in good working order and in compliance with the law. Electrical lighting, wiring, and equipment is in good working order and is in compliance with the law. Common areas under control of the landlord are to be kept reasonably clean. There's an appropriate extermination in response to any infestation. Which brings us to our friend, the bed bugs. All right, so bed bugs have a little bit of their own category. These nasty little guys get in the walls literally and figuratively sometimes. So uh, as a tenant, you must, you have to let your landlord know via written or electronic notice if you know or you reasonably suspect that the dwelling unit contains bed bugs. Landlords, if you receive that notice, you've got to jump into action here. Also, it's the best practice too because these things are hard to get out. And if we are dealing with a multi, with more than one unit, well, they're going to spread, and those treatment costs are going to rise. So, within 96 hours of receiving a notice that there may that there are or very likely are bed bugs in the residence, landlords have to provide a tenant with the 48-hour notice 
of either their intention, an inspector's intention, or a pest control agent's intention to enter the dwelling. And within that 96 hour period, it must also obtain an inspection by a qualified inspector. The landlord may enter the dwelling unit or any contiguous unit for the purpose of inspection. You think about that, if you're, in what, if you're a unit on in the middle of the second floor, you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, potentially eight other units around you if we think kind of tic-tac-toe squares there. If an inspection confirms bed bugs, then the landlord has to inspect all the contiguous dwelling units as promptly as is reasonably practical. Otherwise, the, the treatment, the, the extermination, it may be for nothing if the infestation is already spread. Landlords are responsible for all costs associated with an inspection for and treatment of bed bugs. After the inspection is completed, landlords must give the tenant a written notice within two business days whether the dwelling unit contains bed bugs. If the inspector, if the inspector determines that nope, the unit doesn't, and any all the units we inspected, they don't either. The, land, the notice then also must inform the tenant that if the concerns remain, then the tenant may contact the local health department. If the inspection confirms the presence of bed bugs, then the inspector must provide a report to the landlord within 24 hours. And then not more than five business days after the inspection, the landlord shall commence reasonable measures to effectively treat the bed bug presence, including retaining pest control services. As a tenant, you have to let, let your landlord know, hey, I think I've got bed bugs or I think, or there are bed bugs here. But beyond that, you then have to cooperate with the treatment process. So you've got to comply with reasonable measures to permit the inspection and the treatment, all right? That's going, you're also going to be responsible for all costs associated with preparing the dwelling for inspection and treatment. Sometimes you, you'll have to get all of the dishes and you'll have to get them all kind of Tupperware tubbed up. You've got to buy those Tupperware tubs, that cost is yours. If you've got to, if you have kind of the bottom of furniture that has kind of fabric covering and you receive a checklist of things that must be done prior to the inspection, and one of those is you've got to remove that fabric. Well, guess what? You've got to remove that fabric. It says move it off the wall a foot and a half. You've got to move it off the wall a foot and a half. Because a tenant who knowingly and unreasonably fails to comply with the inspection and treatment requirements is liable for the cost of any treatments and contiguous dwelling units of not only that unit, but of any contiguous dwelling units as well, if the need for treatment arises from the tenant's non-compliance, right? So if you think about that, the initial inspection showed I was just my unit that was the problem. I refuse entry. And now my neighbors on both sides, the infestation has spread. I'm going to be on the hook for the treatment of it all, all right? Landlords shall not rent a unit that they know or reasonably suspect to contain bed bugs. And then upon a tenant's request, upon an applicant's request, landlords shall disclose to that prospective tenant whether, to their knowledge, the unit contained bed bugs within the last eight months and or disclose the last date the unit was inspected for and found to be free of bed bugs. Landlords who fail to comply with the bed bug requirements after being placed on electronic or written notice are going to be responsible for the tenant's actual damages. Landlords may apply for injunctive relief. Remember, that's when we're going to court and having the judge say, hey, you need to stop doing this or you need to start doing this. So landlords, if you are dealing with a tenant that is unreasonably denying you the ability to treat this, in, this, this infestation, you may seek injunctive relief uh, against your tenant uh, who refuses to provide reasonable access to the dwelling, or they fail to comply with reasonable requests for inspection or for treatment. If a court finds that a tenant has unreasonably failed to comply with the inspection, with the treatment, um, with providing access, then they may issue an order granting access to the dwelling, granting the landlord the right to inspect and treat the dwelling, and also may require the tenant to comply with specific inspection and treatment measures or assessing the costs and damages related to the non-compliance. All right, we're out of bed bugs. Um, and hopefully they're out of our lives as well. So in addition, other, th other conditions subject to the warranty of habitability. There must be an adequate amount of outside receptacles for garbage. 
The law does not define what adequate means. However, if we're in one of these nice new 100 unit buildings that are going in downtown here in Colorado Springs, I'm going to take a very well-educated guess that a single trash can is not going to be an adequate amount of outside receptacles. Uh, also, there must be working floors, stairways, and railings. Uh, locks, there must be functioning locks on exterior doors and security devices on windows that open. There also must be compliance with all applicable building, housing, and health codes, which materially interfere with your life, health, or safety. Mold. Uh, so, um, <coughs> microscopic organisms or fungi that can grow in damp conditions in the interior of a building. The, a residence is uninhabitable due to mold when that mold is associated with dampness or there's any other condition causing the premises to be damp, which, if it's not fixed, would materially interfere with the health or safety to, of the tenant. This excludes the presence of mold that is minor and found on surfaces that can accumulate moisture as part of the proper functioning, a part of their proper functioning or intended use. If the bathrooms are going to accumulate moisture, the crawl space above the bathroom should not. Your bedroom closet should not. Appliances are also subject to the warranty of habitability, but this is going to be somewhat limited. So statutorily think what is required for a kitchen. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Can we can yeah. it wait until the end, ma'am? I'm gonna hold I'm trying to get through everything here. We haven't even gotten to the eviction yeah. part yet. I, All right, and I'm trying to get through this in the next uh the next about 15 minutes or so, folks. So I know that I speak fast. I'm trying to enunciate this will be recorded. Uh, but I'm just trying to cover a broad range of topics here. So the warranty of habitability does cover the refrigerator, the range stove, or an oven included with the residence for the tenant's use pursuant to the rental agreement or any other agreement between the landlord and the tenant. The warranty of habitability only applies to the appliances specifically listed in a written agreement or otherwise actually provided by your landlord at the beginning of your tenancy. The law is specific on refrigerator, range stove, oven, we think about that, that makes sense. We need those to have a functioning kitchen. If we are renting a residential property, we are renting a property, presumably, with a functioning kitchen. Uh, if you make a demand based upon appliances and your landlord replaces the appliance, there is a presumption that it is not retaliatory so long as it has substantially the same features as the original appliance. I'm going back to one of my favorite villains, the smart refrigerator. If you have a refrigerator with a television in it, one that you can tap and see inside, and it breaks, and you just get one like me, which is a white fridge, it sits in the corner and it keeps my, keeps my food cold and keeps the frozen things frozen, guess what, it's still a fridge. It's not the fancy fridge, but it's still gonna keep your, your food cold and your frozen goods frozen. Uh, the warranty of habitability also has this kind of, for lack of a better term, a, a catch-all, kind of a, or other section. And this is going to be subjective based on your individual characteristics and things that may have an outsized effect on you as opposed to somebody else. These are going to be conditions that materially interfere with your life, health, or safety. Like I said, these are somewhat subjective, it's going to be dependent upon you and what may affect your life, health, or safety. Uh, it also significantly alters a landlord's response. Um, so let's talk about landlord. We talked about conditions. Let's shift over to landlord breaches and also the responses that I just alluded to on the prior slide. So the residence is uninhabitable when one of those lists of things that we just covered is present or is not present, or we've got the material interference with life, health, or safety, and there's been a reasonably complete written or electronic notice, and the landlord has failed to commence remedial actions by employing reasonable efforts within the required time. It is not just that the condition exists. It is that the condition exists I gave my landlord notice and my landlord did not take proper action. When we get all three of those things, that's when we get to a breach. So when do we have to start the action? What are the timelines here? There are three different timelines, uh, I guess four with the bed bugs as well, but we've already covered that. So there are three additional timelines for us to cover. Materially interferes with your life, health or safety, 24 hours. Condition that is uninhabitable by statute. He, water, stairways, 
adequate trash, uh, 96 hours, but only if you provide your landlord with permission to enter to start the repairs. In the sample demand that's in your packets, folks, you can see that that, is, that type of permission is already included in that sample, that sample notice. Mold has its own timeline. All right, and within nine, so mold, at, within 96 hours after receiving a notice, a landlord must install a containment stopping active sources of water to the mold, a high efficiency particulate air, air filtration device to reduce exposure. It must maintain this containment until the following actions have been completed. And that is within a reasonable amount of time, the landlord must establish appropriate protections for workers and occupants must eliminate or limit moisture sources and dry all material, must decontaminate or remove damaged materials as appropriate, must evaluate whether the premises has been successfully remediated, and must re reassemble the premises to control sources of moisture and nutrients to prevent and or limit recurrence. Right, that's the timeline for mold. Now, kind of seems like the may, I may have kind of hinted at this answer. Does my landlord have to respond to a habitability notice or habitability demand? Yes. Uh, a landlord must respond to a tenant's notice within 24 hours of receiving the notice. Does that just say receive, thanks? No. Uh, the time is extended up to 72 hours if the, this is a new one. If access, if the property is inaccessible <coughs> because of damage due to an environmental public health event, and that 24 hour period is 72 hours. Um, I think wildflower, wild, uh, excuse me, wildfires, floods, uh, things such as this, things of that nature. So I jumped ahead here. What does that response say? It's not just the emoji of thumbs up, right? Uh, it's got to be the landlord's intention for fixing the problem. How are they going to remedy this condition? An estimate of when they're going to start fixing the problem and an estimate of when they're going to finish fixing the problem. <laughs> Um, filing an insurance claim is not fixing anything. That's paperwork. Um, I don't know how, how much more to really delve into that. Uh, does a landlord ever have to provide an alternative, an alternate residence? My home is uninhabitable. Can I get someplace that is habitable to live? In some situations, yes. So if we are dealing with a condition that materially interferes with your life, health, or safety, and you make an affirmative request, then a landlord must provide you. They shall provide you with a comparable dwelling unit or a hotel room as selected by the landlord at no expense uh, or cost to the tenant. A landlord's not gonna be responsible for any other costs that arise after the relocation period. A tenant's still gonna be responsible uh, for, for the terms of the lease for the rent. Uh, and again, this only applies to material uh, material interference with life, health, or safety. All right, so we're still in the breach of the warranty of habitability. I, I apologize for how quickly I'm speaking. I'm trying to get through the presentation and answer some questions here. Uh, so you provided a notice, you've gotten no response. What can you do? You can terminate the lease. Um, if we're talking about that environmental public health event, then, and you provide the notice, the landlord can't fix the problem within 60 days and cannot provide alternative housing. So that's that's going to be a very limited kind of caveat here when we're talking about the warranty of habitability. A tenant can obtain injunctive relief in county court or district court. Again, going to court and saying, judge, my, my home is uninhabitable and my landlord won't fix it. That's where the court can say, you know, landlord, you are required to fix it. You can defend against an eviction for non-payment of rent. The habitability, the habitability issue must begin before the non-payment does. Otherwise, it doesn't really, it's not really logical. Uh, there are other monetary options as well. Uh, so withholding rent, you need to pay the amount withheld to the court to defend to defend against eviction for non-payment uh, unless the court determines that you are indigent for the purposes of the warranty of habitability statute, which we'll get to in just a little bit, hopefully. Uh, if there's a problem with the notice, then there is no defense. You'll be evicted. I really recommend seeking legal advice before you start withholding rent. Uh, also keep in mind, the breach of the warranty of habitability is an independent action, meaning you don't have to wait until an, ev an eviction is filed 
to assert your rights under the warranty of habitability, and you can bring a lawsuit alleging the breach of the warranty of habitability on its own. Uh, monetary options, you can deduct the cost of repairs. Generally speaking, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of skip this. I would advise against doing this. It requires competing estimates. It is kind of tricky. And at the end of the day, I'm not really seeing too much of a benefit to folks. Um, if you do want to choose this route, it's a specific process. It doesn't apply to everyone, doesn't apply to all the issues. I'd seek legal advice before taking this. Are there any exceptions to the warranty of habitability? Yes, uh, there must. So I indicated this under the unenforceable lease provision slide. If you reach a separate written agreement outside of the lease, that is supported by adequate consideration. Consideration typically means money, rent reduction, some kind of benefit to me as a tenant. Why is that the benefit to me as a tenant? Because I have the skills to perform this work. I am a journeyman, I am a journeyman electrician and I am agreeing to take over the electric in this property. Um, so this all has to be written out. This has to be signed. If you, chances are this does not apply to you. If you have questions if this does apply to you, I'd recommend seeking legal advice whether that's with Colorado Legal Services, the Justice Centers, Ask a Lawyer Clinic on Wednesday nights, there are options to try to seek that advice. Um, a breach of the warranty of habitability is not only defense to a collections action in addition to an eviction action. Um, so if you raise as a defense the warranty of habitability against the non-payment of rent, uh, a, you will have to pay a bond unless you are found to be indigent then you will not be required to pay a bond to raise the warranty of habitability as a defense. Here's the slide on determining indigency for this purpose. I'm gonna move past it. Uh, so the court must determine the reduction of a premises of the residence's rental value in its uninhabitable, uninhabitable state to the date of the trial. Why does that matter? Because if the court finds there is a breach of the warranty of habitability, they shall deny possession to the landlord and deem the tenant to be the prevailing party, meaning the tenant has won. The tenant has to pay the rent now that has accrued to that date. However, it is not the full rent due. It is the rent taking into consideration that this is an uninhabitable premises. All right. Um, and that payment must be made within 14 days of to either the court or the landlord. If that payment is not made. Then the court comes back and they say, okay, landlord, we are now awarding you possession and because the tenant has failed to pay the rent that is due. Uh, the court may also order the landlord to make repairs and correct conditions. Uh, they may order that the monthly rent be limited to that uninhabitable rent level until the repairs are completed. And if the court does order repairs, the court's jurisdiction will continue over the case to ensure compliance with its orders. There retaliation, landlords are not able to retaliate against tenants for making a good faith complaint regarding the warranty of habitability to the landlord or to another governmental agency or organizing or becoming a member of a tenants association or similar organization. Uh, retaliation is a defense against eviction. Retaliation can include, but is not limited to, increasing rent, decreasing services, terminating a lease without consent of the tenant except as permitted by law, bringing or threatening to bring an action for possession, uh, and taking action that intimidates, threatens, discriminates, or retaliates against the tenant. Other potential resources as we're dealing with the warranty of habitability, uh, Colorado Springs Planning Community Development, Neighborhood Services Office, Department of Health, and the, the county's version of planning and community development. Code enforcement is not here to enforce the warranty of habitability. It is here to enforce the minimum housing standards of the city code. There is a lot of overlap, but it is not all the same. For example, mold, not enforceable by code, enfor by code enforcement. Opposite of that, window screens are enforceable by code enforcement, not enforceable by the warranty of habitability. You can call, you can submit a warranty of habitability demand letter and call code enforcement. Just do not think the code enforcement will be there to enforce the warranty of habitability. That's gonna happen in a court. All right, we've gotten the security deposits. Uh, security deposit cannot be greater than two months rent. That's the update from last year. Uh, landlords can keep your deposit when there's damage beyond normal wear and tear for the non-payment of rent, the abandonment of the residence, non-payment of utilities, repair or cleaning work that was contracted for the unit by you as the tenant. 
So what is normal wear and tear? This is the usual deterioration which occurs when living in a residence. Think about that, if you have carpet, carpet in front of your door, probably gonna be in front of the door, probably gonna be a little bit worn down. Why is that? That's where you walk. What is not normal wear and tear? Careless or intentional destruction of a property. Hole in the wall, probably not gonna be, you know, the usual deterioration. There's always gonna be an exception, but chances are it's not. So we've hit the end of our tenancy. What are we going, what are we doing now that we are about to move out? Well, we're gonna clean the residence. All right, make sure to get drip pans on the oven and stove. Those are those are annoying to clean, but somebody's got to do it. All right. Um, we're also gonna hopefully maybe do another walkthrough, take another set of pictures. When we take that second set of pictures, we're gonna go back to the first set that we took when we first moved in, and we're gonna take those same pictures. We're gonna show beginning and we're gonna show the end. We're going to return the keys to our landlord. Is that holding on to the keys is a big fact in determining if you if you have actually moved out. We're also going to provide a forwarding address. Why are we providing a forwarding address? We'll get to that, but it's so you can actually receive your security deposit. How long do you how long does your former landlord now have to return your deposit or an accounting statement? 30 days and less the lease extends it up to 60 days. If the lease doesn't extend it to 60 days, it's 30 days. It could be 31, 32, any of those numbers up to 60. Uh, if you do not receive your deposit or an accounting statement indicating the reasons that you are not receiving your deposit, you send it a demand letter. I used to say certified, but with PO boxes, it's just going to float around in the post service and then get returned to you because it's never going to get a signature. So track it. All right. You must keep a copy of the letter as well. Here are some sample letters behind me. And I know the one says 2023, I'll fix that. Uh, but you've also got pack sample letter, ease sample letters in your packet. Um, your landlord may ref only refund part of your deposit. Restrict beware of a restrictive endorsement. They're likely not going to be enforceable. A restrictive endorsement will be something that says this, uh, this amounts to a, a full accounting and resolves the dispute fully. Just be aware of anything like that. Really quick, I forgot to say at the beginning, for those of you who we didn't have as many packets as our people are here, the packet that he's been referring to is available on the city's website. And we'll also send that out and I can show it to you at the end on the website as well. Thank you, sorry. Yeah. Um, oh, why do we have to give, sorry, I thought I, I must have edited that out. We give a forwarding address because the law only requires that our land, our former landlord send the deposit to the last known mailing address. Think about that. If you don't give a forwarding address, the last known address is the address that you no longer live at. That's the last known mailing address, which is the property you just moved out of. So provide a forwarding address. If you don't receive a response to your demand letter, you can initiate a small claims action if the amount is under $7,500. If the amount is under $25,000, you can initiate an action in county court. There's, you can also initiate it if it's $5,000 in county court as well. You can seek treble damages if you file this action within one year and the court finds that it was a willful, a wrongful and willful withholding by your landlord. So uh, there's a case citation there as well about what does willful mean in this situation. All right, early lease termination. When is it permissible? Sometimes by the actual language of the lease, there's a breach of the warranty of habitability. Uh, it is also available as a protection for victims of domestic violence, abuse, stalking, and or a multiple sexual behavior, military orders, acts of God, so long as that was not caused by your negligence. For example, if you set a fire in your apartment and it burns down, that's gonna be a problem. Um, if lightning strikes, and it burns your apartment down, then that's still a problem, but it's less of a problem for you on a personal level as far as legal liability. Uh, multiple warranty of habitability breaches uh, can result in uh, give the tenant the right to terminate the lease agreement if the same condition has rendered the play, rendered your home uninhabitable twice within a six month period, and we are not talking about appliances. Then you just can provide your landlord with a fourteen day notice. Uh, to terminate the lease, there is no opportunity to fix it a second time. The Mobile Home Park Act. These are additional rights for tenants in mobile home parks who own their homes, not for renters. Uh, the homeowners in a park 
uh, must have a written lease or rental agreement. The termination must be for cause, as opposed to ending the tenancy after the lease ends with a notice to quit. The demand is a 90-day cure period, uh, with the exception of non-payment. Uh, there's also a notice to quit is 90 days to move or sell the home. Security deposit can be no greater than one month of rent. Uh, lease requirements in a park. Uh, management must adequately disclose the terms and conditions of the tenancy for any prospective homeowner. Uh, the day that unpaid rent is considered in default for the purpose of establishing a late fee. Name and mailing address where a manager's decision can be appealed and all charges to the homeowner other than rent, including any potential late fees. Here's a list of what constitutes cause for termination, right? I'm going to move past it. When can the park change its own rules and regulations? Uh, if you give them permission, the rule goes into effect immediately. If you do not give your permission, the rule goes into effect with 60 days notice. Uh, homeowners have a right to privacy in a park. Uh, park management has no right to enter a homeowner's home without first obtaining the written consent of the homeowner to carry out statutory duties in the case of an emergency or when the home has been uh, abandoned, this consent can be revoked at any time. Notice of the entry must include the date, approximate time of the planned entry and be delivered in a manner reasonably likely to be seen or heard by the residents. I'm gonna skip through the Mobile Home Dispute Resolution Act. This is a, uh, a less is a administrative procedure. Um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm sorry, folks, I'm just going to skip through the rest of the Mobile Home Park Act and other provisions. Uh, if you want a copy of these slides, please make sure to provide your email address. I still have, as you can see. All right. For, this is, we are now to evictions. Um, I'm going to unfortunately have to go through this quickly so I can open up to questions. Uh, in Colorado, like I said, this is the forcible entry and detainer uh, statute. Uh, landlords must use the court process for evictions, cannot resort to self-help. There's a list of reasons that an eviction can be started. Uh, the packet list those out. Mediation is now required for certain tenants who receive assistance, assistance being SSI, SSDI, or a certain cash assistance, i.e. TANF. Um, mediation is an intervention is an intervention in dispute negotiations by a trained neutral third party with the purpose of assisting the parties to reach their own solution. Um, like I said, uh, tenants who receive SSI, SSDI, or TANF have a right to mediation if they place their landlord on written notice that they receive uh, that they receive the assistance, um, which landlords are required to mediate. Landlords are required unless it is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that offers opportunities for mediation to residential tenants prior to filing a residential eviction court, or the five or fewer exception that we had talked about a little bit earlier. The written inquiry. So the mediation process begins prior to receiving any demand or notice or summons and complaint. Um, landlords are required to ask tenants if they receive the types of income previously outlined. This must be a written inquiry. Verbal questions do not count. Tenants must respond in writing that they do receive the assistance. If they do not receive the assistance, or sorry, if you do not respond in writing that you receive the assistance, then that will result in a waiver of your right to mediation. Uh, mediation, if you're a tenant, you do not have to pay any of the costs for mediation. Landlords, you're going to be required to pay your portion of the mediation. Um, this must be conducted by a trained third party. Um, the Office of Dispute Resolution shall schedule mediations for the first available date, no later than 14 days after the landlord's request for mediation. As a tenant, you do not have to make this request. It is your landlord's responsibility and their duty as a landlord to make this request. Can mediation be waived? No, um, you cannot waive the right to mediation in a lease agreement. You can waive it in actual practice though. Your landlord says, I am going to schedule mediation. You can advise your landlord that you are waiving your right to mediation, but you cannot agree to that in a lease agreement. Would. So the first step in an eviction is going to be receiving a notice or demand. We've got a notice to quit and a demand for compliance listed here on the screen. Both of uh, the demand for compliance is actually an invalid demand for compliance because it does not indicate, uh, I've got to change that. It does not indicate uh, the right to mediation. There is no specific language or state form required for these notice, but there are requirements for each document. There must be a description of the property, a date of the termination of tenancy, and it must be signed by the landlord. That's going to be for a notice to quit. It also must be served by statutory deadlines 
such as for a month-to-month -month tenancy, there must be 21 days prior to the end of the rental month uh, to terminate a tenancy. So what do you do if you receive a demand or a notice? For demand or compliance, if it's non-payment, get started on a rent assistance application. You would heard that there's a new program, uh, the temporary rent assistance grant, that opens up the 15th to the 20th of each month. So we're coming up on that now. If you're facing that situation, I would recommend filling out that application. For other any other violations, um, you know, you've got an unauthorized animal, somebody's living there that shouldn't be. Provide your landlord with documentation that the violation did not occur or fix the problem. Um, by showing your landlord some kind of documentation that the violation has been fixed and cured. There's an issue with landscaping, you fix the problem, you take some pictures, you send them in. Uh, notice quit for substantial violation. Substantial violation, uh, generally speaking, is going to be drugs and crime. Um, there's not an opportunity to fix the problem. Uh, there's a little bit more to it than just drugs and crime. It's specific crimes um, and specific acts. Uh, provide your landlord with documentation showing you do not commit the substantial violation. If it is a notice to quit for repeat violation, meaning that your landlord is claiming that you have violated the same lease provision within more, more than once within a 12 month period, and that condition is not the non payment of rent, you may want to provide your landlord with documentation showing you do not violate the lease provision a second time. If it is a notice to quit, check your lease to make sure that it complies with your lease agreement. Even if it's month to month, if your lease agreement says you have you have a right to 30 days written notice, then that's going to create a larger notice period than the law would. Um, contact your landlord to see if maybe you can work out an extension, uh, or if it's just the, if it's time to move, be prepared to start move start preparing to move out of the residence. So demands for compliance must also include a statement that you have a right to mediation if you receive these if you receive these assistance. This type of assistance. Um, so we've gotten past the notice period, the demand period. The next step in an eviction case is going to be being served with a summons and complaint. Uh, the summons is, uh, there's required language in a summons. It's telling you when you must go to court. It also comes with a list of available resources. You get a summons, look for those resources, see what may be available to you. It doesn't matter what county you live in, this is statewide. It also has to have a copy of a blank answer form and a form that allows either party to request all documents relevant to the current action. Uh, there also has to be affidavits regarding mediation and whether it was and why it was either unsuccessful or why it did not occur. Um, this can be served by personal service uh, or if no one is at home at the time service is attempted by posting. Uh, if, and that's for the demand and a note, a demand for compliance or a notice to quit. If we are dealing with a summons and complaint and the summons and complaint is posted, it must also be mailed within one business day. Uh, if you are served, if the summons and complaint is served by posting and there is no answer filed, uh, then the landlord, the plaintiff can only receive a judgment for possession, cannot receive any kind of judgment for money damages. If you appear on the return date, you waive personal service and now your landlord can pursue money damages. And an answer, this is where you're stating your legal defenses in response to the complaint, why you should not be evicted. And unfortunately, a lot of reasons are not going to be legal defenses. I need more time, not going to be a legal defense. I lost, unfortunately, loss of job, not going to be a legal defense. I had a severe hospitalization, not going to be a legal defense. Um, this is where mediation may be helpful to resolve the dispute and try to come up with some kind of agreement. So the answer is going to set forth the legal defenses. Uh, it's due by 5 p.m. on the date of the return. So even if you have an 8.30, if you have an 8.30 court date that is in person and you go at 8.30, you still have until 5 p.m. to file your answer. Improper notice must be raised in an answer or by filing a motion pre-hearing. You cannot raise the defense that the notice or the demand is missing uh, critical and necessary information for the first time in the hearing if you did not raise this previously in your answer or in a pre-hearing motion. The trial shall be set uh, by the court seven to 10 days after an answer is filed. Uh, between the filing of an answer and a trial, the court shall order that the landlord and or tenant provide any documentation relevant to the action. Hearing non-payment of rent, if we are dealing with non-payment, as a tenant, you have the ability to pay all amounts due according to the notice as well as any that became due 
up until a judge issues a judgment for possession. You may tenants may pay that amount to the landlord, or if your landlord says, "Hey, I'm not taking that," or going to court. Oh, great! You can go to court and you can pay it into the court registry, and it has the same legal effect. So long as you're paying in full. Once the court confirms that the full amount has been timely paid, the court is required to vacate any judgments that have been issued and dismiss the action with prejudice. If a landlord does not follow the proper procedures for mandatory mediation to include the for, include asking in writing at the beginning, then that's going to be a defense against any eviction. The warranty of habitability is also a defense. Um, if it is for issues beyond non-payment, if there is retaliate, if the, we are if we are in kind of retaliation. Um, again, yeah, a rule violation. Uh, attorney fee update to obtain a judgment for attorney fees following eviction. The court must determine who the prevailing party is and that the requested fees are reasonable. So make sure to appear on your return date. Um, here in El Paso County, you're gonna see it's a non-appearance date, which means there's not actually a courtroom for you to go to, but you still have to appear, you still have to appear either in person or an answer. I know I'm taking a while, little guy. We'll be done soon. All right, so a writ of restitution. At this point, we've gone to the hearing itself, and the court has found in favor of the plaintiff, in favor of the landlord. What happens next? Well, the court issues what's called a judgment for possession. That's the legal phrase for eviction, but that does not mean that you go home to change locks or a board over the door, or all your stuff outside. That's gonna happen, that may happen a little bit later, but 48 hours, the court issues what's called the writ of restitution. This is the document that allows law enforcement to remove you from the property, return possession back to your former landlord. That cannot be executed until at least 10 days after the judgment, or if you are a tenant who receives SSI, SSDI, or TANF 30 days after the judgment. That's the update. And it applies to, it does not apply to substantial violation cases, and it does not apply to five or fewer. Unlawful removal, if a landlord goes through, uh, evicts without the court process, um, you can seek uh, $5,000 or three times a monthly rent, whichever is higher, and the actual damages. If you think this situation may apply to you, I would recommend strongly seeking legal advice. Uh, the court may also order in this situation that if you've been wrongfully evicted without the due process of court, they can order that possession be restored. Uh, fair housing, this prohibits at a state and federal level, there's prohibits discrimination based on race, color, disability, sex, sexual orientation, including transgender status, national origin, ancestry, religion, creed, marital status, and or familial status. Exceptions here are owner-occupied buildings with four units or less, single family housing sold or rented without the use of a broker, housing operated by organizations and private clubs that limit occupancy to members. Prohibition on discrimination in housing based on source of income. Long story short, you gotta take the money. Um, any money that's derived from a lawful profession or occupation and income or rental payments derived from any government or private assistance grant or loan program. You cannot refuse to rent to somebody because they are on a voucher. You cannot publish that you will not rent to somebody because they are on a voucher. Service animals versus emotional support animals. Service animals are covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. They are a dog or a miniature horse. They are trained to do work or perform tasks. This is not a pet. This is a medical device. This is the same as an oxygen tank. Uh, an emotional support animal is not covered explicitly by the Americans with Disabilities Act. There are potential fair housing protections here. However, for an emotional support animal, a therapy animal, we've now entered into a reasonable accommodation area. What's a reasonable accommodation? Uh, so it is essentially asking your landlord, hey, here's your rule. I have this disability. I'm asking you to accommodate my disability by providing me with this amendment, this exception to the rule. And it is discrimination to refuse to make reasonable accommodations necessary to afford a person with a disability the equal opportunity to, to use and enjoy the residence. Um, grab bars in a shower, a reserved parking space in the front of the lot. Uh, I'm sure there are other ones that I'm not thinking of at the moment as I'm frantically trying to get to the end here. There's no magic language to make the request, but you must be specific in what it is that you are actually requesting. It must be in writing. 
Um, and if, again, must state what the actual accommodation is that you are requesting. Uh, there's a sample letter in the packet. Here's a sample letter. All right. I got the questions. We're only 15 minutes over, folks. All right. Um, I'm gonna... Yes, sir. Uh, did you mention anything about uh, security? I mean, uh, renter's insurance? How much a landlord can charge? I did not. I did not. There's. Uh, Is there a law where they can not say, to, I want 500000 Not to my knowledge, sir. But if they're. Because uh, uh, like your renter's insurance covers your stuff plus any damage that you would do. Right, 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 right. Uh, to my knowledge, there are not. Uh, and if I have overlooked uh, a new law, I'm sure somebody in the chat is going to point it out to us. But to my knowledge, uh, I'm unaware of any current legislation uh, that addresses renters and shorts. And the discrimination goes through HUD. Uh, it can. can it, it, there's, it's state and federal. So it can go through. HUD would be the federal arm of that. Colorado's attorney general would be the state arm of that as well. Because fair housing exists, there are fair housing statutes at both the state and the federal level. So HUD addresses feds and the AG addresses state. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I know you've been waiting with a question. I got several. Okay. Okay. To begin with, if the landlord, uh, if one tenant is in a state of a death, is in a time of a death in the apartment, and one tenant says to the landlord, I'm finished with the, with the apartment, the other tenants have not been able to get in and because they changed the lock. I had this happen to my son, my job, my grandkids. Okay, so the answer is, I, I, the, the honest answer is I don't know. That's gonna be a little too fact specific for me to get into tonight. If a tenant does pass away, one thing that you may want to review then is the lease agreement itself because sometimes the lease agreement will have a uh, succession clause, such as you know this, this contract is binding on the parties, their heirs, their assignees, their successors and in interest. So there may be some kind of protection in the law itself. In regards to changing the locks, if that may fall under a wrongful eviction, but I would need more information and that additional information will take us into legal advice, which I'm not able to provide this evening, only legal information. We answered one of my questions already. The other question is, if the landlord knows that there is an asbestos in the building, what can the tenant do? Um, if that is a condition that is materially interfering with your life, health, or safety, then you would want to place your landlord on notice of a potential breach of the warranty of habitability. Um, yes, ma'am. So back when you were talking about um, the 12 month lease agreement and the guarantee of the lease price at that <coughs> for that period of time, we moved in in October. They raised the Nope, nope, day. we're now in legal advice already. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Like, uh, that, that would be a question that you'd be able to contact CLS to apply for potential okay. services. Okay. And I'm, I apologize for shutting That's you down, okay. but to go back to that point, if you sign a lease agreement for 12 months and your lease says, this is your rent amount. Make sure to read it. Generally speaking, what that means is for 12 months, your lease, your rent is X. All right, and I'll come back to you in just a second, okay? Yes, sir. In that same vein, is there a uh, limit to what an increase could be at the end of the lease for renewal as far no. as monetary or? At this point in time, no, there is no cap on how high the increase can be. The only limitation is once per 12 months, all right? Um, yes, sir. During the eviction process, uh, I guess it states that you're supposed to put your stuff out by the street. Yes, sir. What do you, what do you do? Right, well, do they have to put everything out? Yes. Uh, unless it's something that's going to be hazardous. Also, the the individual, the organization that is doing that is not your landlord. That's going to be that's going to be the sheriff department 
and they will have, there are rules related to that. They will not remove items that are going to be, that may create a public health issue. It may create an issue if they are removed. Um, they remove the property. They cannot hide it. They cannot put it in the dumpster. It does get removed to a public location and it is there for a reasonable amount of time. After a reasonable amount of time, if you ask me what that is, the law doesn't define it. The landlord can then move it to the move it to dumpster area, trash area at that point, because they're going to have obligations with respect to kind of keeping the air, keeping their public spaces clear of obstacles. Um, yes, ma'am. And then I'm going to go to the folks online. I am going to come to the chat here in just a second. I was just working my way around the room here. Okay. When you have a lease that says you're going to pay rent plus a percentage of the insure, um, electricity, gas and stuff for the whole building, um, is the landlord obligated to give you what that what that amount is, or do they have free will to take out a sum of money out of your um, what do you call it when you have your your account where they can pull it out of your checking account? Um, um, that's because be in, in yes, November yeah. and December they used to send cards that said you're so, part of the utility we're, we're, we're now too specific we've now gotten into legal advice okay okay, okay. so i so uh, is it because uh, okay so because uh, what is the law regarding when you sign a lease and it says you uh, you're going to pay some of the utility says uh, because you can't put the amount on there can you when you sign the lease because every month it's going to be a different thing so ma'am i'm going to have to the same is thing same okay. thing because yeah. we know we're talking about your lease um so it is something that i would have to review to determine what the how you know okay if the then lease in a more general problem. sense a new uh, you have a place where somebody you signed a 12-month lease with sold the property mm -hmm. What is, as a tenant, what is your responsibility to do the new person that you have not signed a lease with? Your lease is to, your lease is a contract. So you have the same obligations to the buyer that you would to the seller. But because they, can they change it on their side? If we're, ta we're talking about an apartment building here, no, they yeah. have knowledge that you okay. have a lease agreement. All right. So, okay. um, so long as they have that, then you may be best practice may be to provide them with a copy of it in case the prior landlord didn't keep great records. Okay. Right? That'll, so that'll be better than nothing. <laughs> so I am going to go to some of the online questions here, folks. Um, the first one shows up at 7.05. How long do landlords, rental managers have to provide the radon acknowledgement if this was not included in the lease agreement? Um, <clears throat> would be with uh, make a written demand of the radon acknowledgement then if that's not included in the lease agreement the laws went into law on august 4th is there a time period august 4th 2024 is there a time period where they do not have to include this information in the lease related to question above sorry sent too soon um I'm, I'm sorry, you've got me stumped. I don't, off the top of my head, I don't have that answer. Will you be providing the PowerPoints as well? Yes. Thank you. If you end your lease early, can the landlord force the renter to pay the rent until the end of the lease? No. No. Um, that's going to be a general contract matter. Uh, they're going to be they can pursue actual damages, such as the amount of time where the resident sat empty based upon the early termination. So no, there's also a general concept of a duty to mitigate a contract breach. So um, they have to try to make the damages less. Ma'am, I'll come back to you. I know you have yeah, more no, questions. I was gonna answer, answer her question. What my, with the apartment building where I live, they take it divided by how many people are in the building, mm -hmm. and then they give us a, a, a thing listing how much we owe. And they were, but they aren't now. Huh? Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, we, we've got about 10 minutes, folks. I'm going to try to get through as many more questions as I can, sir. I know you had your hand up as well, ma'am. I know you have your hand up. I'm still trying to get through the ones online here. All right. They are, we're getting close to the end of theirs. Uh, in the case of opening windows on the second floor of a four, fourplex, are need locked windows? Yes. Yes. If the window opens, it requires a security device. Um, in a smoke-free community with neighbors, cigarette and marijuana smoke infiltrating my apartment and isolated to the one wall shared with another unit, what is my recourse? Um, I review your lease to see what, if anything, your lease does uh, or how it addresses potential neighbor disputes. Uh, you indicate that your leasing agent and another neighbor came to my unit, confirmed it, but other tenants lied. What is my recourse? At this point, we are way too far into legal advice. Um, I would recommend seeking further legal counsel on that matter. My complex is open on Saturdays and Sundays as well as every weekday. We had mice running around our apartment Saturday morning and I had called and made an email work order for an emergency pest control as I had an eight month old who was calling. Um, do I have reason to terminate my lease now? Unfortunately, this is way too fact specific. This is going to be constituting legal advice as this would require me applying the facts of your individual situation to the law that would apply in this case, and I am unable to provide that tonight. Um, a repeat of that. Uh, uh, about waiting three months for security lights. Again, we're asking for, that's going to be calling for a legal, legal advice answer, so I cannot address that in this evening's forum. Uh, if you end your lease early, can the landlord force the renter to pay? We've already addressed that. Someone raising his hand. I do that as well. I'm doing my best here. Um, if you call your apartment and make a maintenance request and it is put into an email on the portal for maintenance and they don't do anything for five calendar days, is the lease able to be terminated? No, not on, not on the basis of a maintenance request. That's not a warranty of habitability notice. All right. Um, Back around the room. Yes, ma'am, in the green. And sir, I'm coming to you next. It can a renter at time of leaving the permit at the, the apartment, can they walk through with the people on the, the apartment building on, on to make sure everything is okay? If they agree to it, yeah, there's nothing preventing that from happening. Uh, so folks online, the question was. Uh, if you're moving out, can the former can the person who is moving out do a walkthrough at the end of the tenancy? Um, I, there's nothing preventing that from happening. I think that may be the best practice if that is possible. It's also not required by law. Yes, sir. And then, sir, I know you had your hand up as well. Keys uh, to return the keys uh, to the landlord and or the landlord responsible for rekeying the locks at the front of this, let's say, a house, apartment. To ensure safety. Uh, no, I hear you. Um, I, you know, I, I think best practice would be to communicate how you want the keys returned. All right, um, whether that be in a Dropbox or some other method of that. But generally speaking, with rekeying, I would be a, if it were my property, I'd feel a lot better if I rekeyed after every after every tenancy, just as kind of an overhead cost of the property. You don't know how many keys may have been copied um, and it's it's not required by law, but I think it would go to kind of best practice of rekeying the property after each tenancy has ended. Um, but as far as did I address the question, sir? I'm sorry if I yeah no no yeah, yeah. Okay. it's not it's not legal. But with the uh, addition of another adult in the home, let's say they have mother-in-law, that kind of thing. Uh, what's the requirements on that? That's based on your lease that which is oh oh the, oh. The, uh, the one, one adult, obviously minor children are different. But right, that's familial status then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it, you're really only getting into any kind of code occupancy standards. Yeah. Uh, the lease state says who the authorized documents are. The lease says who the authorized documents are. That would be a term of the lease agreement. Right. So if it's not agreed upon, then it may be a breach. Could okay. be a breach of the lease. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, in the back. And ma'am, I'm coming to you next. I saw you with your hand up as well. I apologize if I missed anybody over here. You're out of my periphery a little bit. Um, Regarding application fees, yes. like portal access, charging for portals to be able to submit notice to, or separate portal to be able to do 
um, inspection to can the can it be in the lease to charge you a fee to have that as an access? What portal? Let's say they have an, an online access, an app. And they're going to charge. It's in the lease. It says oh. there's a fee for the. Uh, app. The it's only good. Way you can communicate. You have to pay for it to communicate with the property manager. They're charging fees to do that. Well, I want to see this lease clause. <laughs> um, generally speaking, so it, that's going to be. Yeah. You said the magic trigger words, which make me go up oh, legal advice. Okay. But that strikes me as odd. That's but. Uh, can't bill more than 2% for third party services um, or up to $10 a month. I don't, I don't know about being able to communicate with your landlord generally. That I don't know. Uh, that would be a novel issue for me. Is the landlord providing a tenant portal to request to pay your rent to do those things? And there's a fee for that. And charge you air filters for a house that doesn't have air. <laughs> so, so. Just curious. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Well, um, there's 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 our contact information. Um, we're located at 102 102 South Tejon Street 430. To add to this question, nobody to ask you: Is there a way to talk to somebody that actually goes and like double checks what these property managers are doing? that they're doing everything legit, or does it always have to be us who then starts a legal process to have them held accountable for their wrongdoing? I mean, is there not anyone out there that you can call that says, hey, can you just check out this property manager? I'm pretty the sure I'm not the only tenant that's like being abused. The no. attorney general. Just the attorney Social general. Media. Okay. Uh, Social media. Social <laughs> you know, okay. if we're, media. If we're talking, if we're a homeowner in a mobile home park, the mobile home dispute uh, resolution. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can work. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so I can only say like I'm talking about someone I know, but all right, in her apartment complex, and it's a she calls herself a community manager. Mm -hmm. All right, and one of her tenants been living there for about eight months. It hasn't been a year yet, and then they went on and and i guess they got taken over by new a new ownership mm -hmm. some company i don't know what walked them out and the tenant was normally paying their rent through like a website mm -hmm. but they weren't notified that the website or phone numbers or you know anything changed and then all of a sudden they get an eviction notice on the door <laughs> is the tenant in the wrong i mean should they have uh, if the rent hasn't well like Since I know that we're talking about a situation that you have a lot of maybe a personal experience with, it's going to be tricky because if I'm going to say, well, it depends on this, and you're going to say, well, it was that. Um, so it's, we're gonna, you're asking me for legal advice right now. Um, however, I actually you, went to the, your um, that building today, and they told me to come to this. Oh, okay. <laughs> so should I go back to them? Uh, yeah, you may want to go back and tell Eric uh, tomorrow that you want to actually fill out an application this time. Okay. <laughs> All right, because generally speaking, I would want to see what are we talking about. I okay. I, I don't doubt that you do, <laughs> but I don't have the time tonight to look over right, it. So no, I'm guessing you talked to him or uh, Alanis at the front desk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's how, that's how it's yeah. Eric and Alanis. Um, so. Sir, I, I see your hand raised as well. There were a couple more uh, questions online. Rick, if you're still with us online, I saw you had your hand up. Uh, did I, did. I address your question yet? Uh, Rick, uh, Rick, you see, do I need to have the renewal contract for a lease? What should be included? Um, if it's a lease renewal, I uh, just kind of want to make sure that you have the same kind of, you want to make sure that the terms of the lease are clearly stated in the renewal. All right, if it was a written lease agreement and you want to keep the same terms of that the same, you probably want to indicate that in the renewal agreement as well. And just say that all of the provisions are the same. We are amending, you know, we are renewing this for renewing the lease entered into on X date for a period of blank. Uh, all of the conditions remain the same. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Folks, I am still trying to address some questions. All right. Okay. Um, Rick, did that adequately answer your question? I know you've been waiting to ask that for a while, sir. It does. It does. Thanks for your uh, comments. I, I can't, Rick, I can't hear you. Thanks for your comments. 
All right, all right, all right. <laughs> uh, I mean, if there's, if I didn't answer it, please just, please drop in the chat what I didn't answer, and I'm going to get to my next question. Yes, sir. What is the covenant of uh, quiet enjoyment? That's a great question. Uh, the covenant of quiet enjoyment is essentially the promise that you get to, that you get to use your your residence as a residence. Um, and uh, there's a very old case on this where somebody rented a place and then a printing press opened up next door and just kind of 24 hours, just, you know, just think about if all of a sudden you, your apartment became in the middle of an Amazon warehouse, that's going to be a lot of noise. You're not going to have any, you're not going to have any quiet enjoyment. So it's going to be fact-based. Okay. Also, because this comes from common law, when we're talking about the implied covenant, that means that it's not written explicitly. It's not written into the law itself, and we go back through cases to determine, all right, what are the factors that we look through to determine whether or not there's been a breach of the covenant of quiet enjoyment? Generally, it has to be under your landlord's, the landlord's control or their ability to influence, and then they choose not to after being put on notice that, hey, I'm not able to use my home as a home anymore. It's a little bit different than the warranty of habitability because the home may still very well be habitable, but it can't be used effectively as a home. Of course. Let me just something about a Wednesday lawyer thing. The Justice Center um, has on Wednesday evenings, they have a call lawyer clinic. 7 to 8.30. The phone number is 719-382-9000. Okay. Seven, one, nine, four, seven, you don't need an appointment. Just call. I would just call right at seven if it's busy. Well, wait, can you repeat it one more time? Yeah. yeah. Every Wednesday, <laughs> 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. You call 719-473-6212. Thank you. Yeah, I give that number out a lot. <laughs> and then did I miss any questions over here? I'm so sorry. Y'all were kind of out of my periphery, my periphery, so I didn't see any hands raised. Yes, sir. Um, regarding renter's insurance, can a landlord require that they be an address of notice on the renter's insurance? Yeah. I don't know. I'd have to look at it a little bit more. I'd have to kind of dig into the. I'd have, I'd have to dig into the details on that one. So that's always something that kind of strikes me as a little bit odd, but I can't say. I can't sit here and say, well, Colorado Valley statute, blank, 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 says no. I, I don't have that that recall at the moment. Yes. I, think I kind of, when you were talking about credit score earlier, did you did you say something that they can't discriminate or whatever against credit score? What, what did you say about that purpose? I uh, can't consider credit score, adverse credit events, or lack of credit score in a, rent, in a rental application. Because just of last year, you said this all started in fall when all of these that you've been going over started in fall. Maybe it was December. Maybe because maybe I just August. noticed that property managers were starting to charge people additional on top of their rent because of their credit score. Is that, yeah. is that I mean, is that a law? They can do that now? or that Maybe problematic. Okay, because I thought, I mean, it was a red flag to me when I saw that. And I mean, if you go on any of the flag. websites for property managers now, they are doing it left and right, charging more than the pet deposit fees that you were talking about. Then the pet deposit fees are new. Yeah, I mean, it's January like the one fees day. are going crazy. That's why I asked you if there was a number to call to be like, you know, can you check this property management company? The attorney, the attorney general. general. Okay. Did I miss? Yes, and I think this will be the last question. Oh, thanks. Um, with the year-long rental contract with the options to renew, and you, um, you're supposed to get a 60-day notice of an increased rent, if you don't receive that 60-day notice. Folks, folks, I'm sorry, can I, just, a, just a little bit of quiet here. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get this last question. If the 60-day notice is not received to renew? To, to and of an increase of rent and of anything. Oh, okay, 60-day um, well, recourse. Yeah, the recourse is you don't have an increase. So if the, the question was for those online, if you have a 12 month lease with an option to renew and there is an attempt to increase the rent on less than 60 days notice, guess what? There is no increase of rent. That's correct. But the but one one caveat there, this is legal information. I cannot say that, that applies to your individual situation because I would also definitely need to read the option to renew. 
But if it's less than 60 days notice, your rent cannot be increased on that and your landlord cannot provide you with a notice to quit to circumvent the 60 day requirements. All right, um, I don't see any other questions online. Thank you folks so much for attending this evening. I really appreciate it. Thank you.